you remember last week, Moses was standing at a burning bush and God spoke to him and he said, here's my name. And what was his name? I am who I am. I have always been. I am today. I will be forever. He's the Alpha and the Omega. And then he sent Moses to, to lead his people out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And Moses decided, do you remember last week, what does side mean? The side, the suffix and decide. He cut off or he killed off what was happening in his life up to that point, which was 40 years of shepherding. He decided to turn from watching sheep for 40 years to follow what God had for him, which was to lead people and to lead his people, God's people, the Israelites, out of slavery, which they were in for 400 years. And so he brought them out of Egypt and made his way across the Red Sea. And you'll see on this map that the Red Sea uh, also includes the Gulf of Suez and the Gulf of Aquaba today. And tradition says that Moses led the Israelites across the Gulf of Suez somewhere there. We're not exactly sure, but, but and then tradition says that he went to Mount Sinai. We have it over here. I'll, be, I'll explain it in a minute. But tradition says that Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb, near where the burning bush was, where God spoke to him, is in the center of the Sinai Peninsula, which is that upside down triangle between the two gulfs. And Today, you can actually go there to a monastery that's called St. Catherine's Monastery, and apparently they have this bush that could have been the burning bush, and they say Mount Sinai is right there. Um, And do you know how it got there? Do you know how they decided that was the spot? Because Constantine, who was a Roman emperor around 300 AD, because his mom said so. And so if your mom says so, what should you do? You do what mom says, right? <laughs> and he did what mom says. And so his mom had, had a dream. And based on her dream, she said that this must be the spot. But evidence, I mean, we don't know for sure. But it's, it's really interesting what evidence has brought forth in the last few years, few decades, and, and recent discoveries that it wasn't the Gulf of Suez, it wasn't the quote unquote the Red Sea part where they passed through, but possibly the Gulf of Aquaba is where they passed through. And some even say they went alongside, you know, the, the outside of that upside down, upside down triangle. And basically where the word of is, some people say, well, that's where they went across. And that there was this underwater mountain. If you go to the next slide, um, yeah, so there's Egypt and they crossed the Gulf of Aqaba into modern day Saudi Arabia. And even today they have discovered an underwater um, bridge, land bridge. If, here's the water, the surface of the water going from Egypt over to Saudi Arabia. There is an underwater land bridge. And so the Israelites, if you go to the next slide, the Israelites passed over that land bridge and you know, by some miracle that the water receded. But here's, here's the thing. In Scripture, though, it says there was water on their right side and on their left side. There was walls of water. So there could have been a land bridge, but there was absolutely a miracle as well, work of God, where he receded the waters and there was walls of water on either side of them. And so they crossed over to Saudi Arabia, which is Ma, uh, uh, Median, uh, Midian, where he uh, was a shepherd for 40 years. And so that's where he spent his time. And we know that that part of Saudi Arabia was ancient Midian. And there uh, is a mountain in that part of Saudi Arabia. And explorers have gone over there. They they have found it. And um, new investigations have shown that this mountain is called Jebel El Laz. Jebel El Laz, and it exists today. It's a mountain about uh, 8,000 feet in, in height. And uh, ancient uh, or, or Bedouins have called that the mountain of God for many, many years. And so there's some, some explorers who have been there. Uh, one of them, his name is Robert Cornuke. And he, he experienced what you can see here. There's, a, there's the mountain. This is Google Earth as we zoom in. It's got a blackened top to it. Now, who knows? But... It's interesting. I find this really interesting. If you zoom in one more time, next slide, and you can see the black on top of it. And he says, when he went up there, he said it's not volcanic rock because he busted open some rocks. And if it was volcanic, it would be dark throughout. But he busted it open and it was not dark on the inside. So he's saying, well, maybe this is because 
of Exodus 19:18, which says, Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in what? In fire causes huge fire on the top of this mountain. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently. And so this explorer, this man said who, who he was looking at this mountain, walking on it, he claims that maybe it was because of the fire and it still continues to be black to this day at the peak of this mountain. You can, you can look into uh, the, the research that this man has done. So when the people of Israel first arrived at Mount Sinai, at this mountain, if this was in fact the mountain, Moses goes to the top of the mountain. And God tells them something. God tells them to remind the people of Israel of something that's very important. And if you got your Bible, uh, turn to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. If you got your smartphone, you can scroll to Exodus 19 on your favorite Bible app. Uh, But before we get there, I want to talk about order because order is important. Everybody say order. order. Order is very important. If you're a hunter, order is important to you. You don't go ready, fire, aim right? You don't go ready, fire, aim. Uh, If you are married or you want to be married, order is important. You don't meet, propose, get married, and then date, at least not in our culture, okay? You meet somebody and then you spend some time with them and, and, and you ask the Lord, is this the person who I should be with? Getting dressed, order is important. Uh, how many of you put your shoes on and then your socks this morning? Look around. Did anybody do that? Matt, you're good? All right. You got the order right. Good job. Good job. Order's important. How many of you brush your teeth right before you eat dinner? No, no, you don't do that. Have you ever done that right before you have had some orange juice? If you've never tried that, go and have an experience, okay? You'll never have it again because it's nasty, but it's so shocking. Um, Swimming, swimming. You don't jump into a pool and then pull your phone out of your pocket, okay? There's order there. Or if you get pulled into a pool, you got to pull your phone out first. Order matters. Order matters. If you want to pull out your sermon outline notes, you can follow along. This is the first fill-in. Order matters. Exodus 19, 4 through 6, it says, You yourselves, and this is God talking to Moses at the top of the mountain, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my commandment, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Everybody say treasured possession. Isn't that wonderful word picture? That's what we are to God, a treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. One commentator said that this is the most astounding visual aid of the gospel of saving grace. Remember this, Exodus 19, 4 through 6, an incredible painting of the gospel of grace. Now, nothing in this verse should be taken out of order because order is very important and what God lays out, what God wants to remind the Israelites, and what I believe God wants to remind you and me today. Nothing should ever get in the way of the order of these three things that we find in these verses. Number one is salvation by grace. Number two, obedience. Number three, blessing. It's in that order. Salvation by grace, obedience, blessing. Let's say it out loud, church. Salvation by grace, obedience, blessing. One more time. Salvation by grace, obedience, blessing. Salvation by grace. God says, I carried you on eagle's wings to myself. You didn't carry yourself. It wasn't in your own power. And God says the same thing today. If you want to come to me, it's not because of anything in you. It's because of everything I've done and I've provided for you through Christ. I am the one who said, you know, I'm going to give my son and he is going to die on a bloody old Roman cross for you. That was a work of God, not a work of you, not a work of me. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not from any man, but the gift of God. So salvation by grace. God is the one who initiates. And then two is obedience. It says, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant. Understand that God is a God who saves. 
He loves you so much that he provided a way to come to him through Christ. That was a work of him. That was his gift. But then he calls you and me to obey. Jesus said in 14, uh, John 14, 23, Jesus said, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. So salvation by grace, obedience number three is blessing. Blessing. God said, you will be my treasured possession. And then he qualified it. He said, although the, the whole earth is mine, you will be a kingdom of priests. A kingdom of priests. If you are a Christ follower, God considers you a priest. It says in 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You see, priests are close to God and they bring people to God. They live a life close and close relational connection with their heavenly father and they want to bring people into a close relational connection with their heavenly father. God is saying that if you do realize how much you are treasured, you're going to want to live your life set apart unto this amazing God who gave you this incredible gift of salvation. And you want to love him with your obedience. And then you're going to live away in a way that pleases your beloved and that causes people around you to see God. You will become a light in the world. You're the light of the world. You will be showing the world the glory of God, and you will become a matchmaker, a matchmaker. How many of you have ever been matched up by a friend, you know, set up on a blind date or something? Put up your hand if you've ever, ever done that. Now, how many of you get annoyed with people, you know, who do that or are matchmakers? They try to set you up on dates, and if you're married, maybe, just a quick poll, if you are married, how many of you were set up on a date by a matchmaker? Put up your hand. Put up your hand. Maybe it was a friend or a relative, a few people. Okay, okay. But matchmakers, it can be kind of annoying, right? I mean, come on, I'll figure this out myself. I'll find the, the person that God has for me. I don't want to go and, and meet some strange person and have to spend two hours at a meal and be very uncomfortable. And you kind of get annoyed with people. How many of you have ever been a matchmaker? Put up your hand. It's kind of fun, right? <laughs> it's awesome because you never know what's going to happen. Maybe some people get annoyed with you and mad at you. And, 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 and you do. You get mad at a matchmaker. Leave me alone, okay? I'm a bachelor to the rapture. Get out of here. <laughs> but you're only annoyed at a matchmaker until when? Until it works out right? How many of you, if you were set up on a date and you have been married for years, are thankful for that matchmaker who came and was a catalyst for you to meet your spouse? When it works out, hallelujah, right? Amen. Well, that's what you're called to do. You are called to be an annoying matchmaker to introduce people to the love of their life, which is God Almighty. And sometimes, you're going to be annoying. Many times, they're going to say, quit talking about him. I'm tired of you talking about your love for Christ. I'm tired about you talking about church. I'm tired about hearing you talk about Operation Christmas Child. And they're only going to be annoyed until when? Until it works out. And when it works out, they're going to thank you for being that annoying matchmaker and pointing them to Christ. Now, what happens when you take it out of order, when you take um, salvation by grace, obedience, and blessing out of order? Well, A, it's I obey, therefore I'm accepted. You're thinking, okay, I need to obey in order to get accepted by God, in order for God to, to love me and to bless me, in order for me to get noticed by God. I better obey, so I'm noticed. But that's backwards versus I'm accepted, therefore I obey. And that's the reality. God loves each and every one of you. And because of that, you want to obey. But if you're doing A, you're operating out of fear versus love. You're operating out of fear versus love. And it's self-centered when you do that. Why do you obey? Because you want to get something for yourself. It's all about 
you. It's all about maybe what you can get from God. I want your attention as opposed to doing stuff for God because you know how much he loves you. If you look in your notes, there's an A, but you're missing a B. Right B, right beside, is a person who already has everything. So if you get this order right, you understand that you're a person who already has everything they need, which is found in Christ. You obey out of a loving response to God, out of a loving response to God. And guess what? You're thinking more about God and his love for you, and that's humility. I love C.S. Lewis's definition of humility. He says, true humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Did you catch that? He says, true humility is not thinking less of yourself. God's done a great job making each and every one of you. He has incredible purpose for your life. So true humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. You obey not because you want to be good, but because you are thinking of God, of your beloved, of the one who offers you salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. See, you can do the right things for the wrong reasons. Did you know that? And there may be people in our church who have come here for for many years, and they come here thinking, you know, I need to get to church, I need to serve, because I need to work my way to get God to notice me. But that's, that's wrong. That's wrong. It's not about you. God has already done something for you. It's not about working your way to get God. It's understanding that of what God has already done for you through Christ. He loves you so much that he came all the way to earth and hung on a Roman cross because he loves you so much. He came that far for you. And it was a work of God, not a work of you. And so our motivation for loving God is his love for us. If it's law and then acceptance, then you have to be good enough. But nobody is good enough. Nobody can satisfy 100% of the law. If you fall in love with someone, you try to find out what pleases them. I love my wife. We've been married 17 years. And I know what she likes. When we go out on a date, she loves to go out to dinner and a movie. Dinner and a movie. She loves it. And you know what? If... I was asked about what I would want to do on a date. I wouldn't choose dinner in a movie. (laughs) I'd probably want to go on a hike or go to the beach, do something active. I I love the ocean. I feel like the the ocean beckons me to to come and spend some time there. I just love it, and I love to share that with my beloved. But you know what? I love going to dinner and a movie because I love pleasing my beloved. And I know it makes her happy, and she loves it. And I love that. I love making her happy. And so if you love someone, you want to find out what pleases them. You're seeking the will of your beloved. What does your beloved want? What does your heavenly father, your ultimate beloved, want? Are you seeking? When you find out, you want to delight him. And that's what the Ten Commandments are all about. And we'll get into that in just a moment. But first, let's talk about what kind of God he is and how he came and how he revealed himself to Moses and the Israelites. I like what pastor and author Tim Keller says. He uses these words. He says, God is a terrifying and beckoning God. He is a terrifying and beckoning God. That's your second fill in there on point number two. Terrifying and beckoning God. It says in Exodus... Everyone in the camp trembled. When the Israelites were gathered, uh, camping down below in the valley by Mount Sinai, they trembled as they considered God. By the way, that reference is Exodus 19.16, not 16.16. You may want to change that. I think the ocean is terrifying. You ever get terrified when you stand by the ocean? You realize how small you are and how strong and mighty it is. I mean, an earthquake could happen, and in, in a moment's notice, there could be a tsunami, and you, along with everybody along the coast, could be toast. I mean, that freaks me out when I think about that a lot. Do you remember the, the tsunami in, in Southeast Asia? And, and they just wiped it. You have no control. It's, it, it, it is terrifying, and it will just overtake you no matter what you do. 
you're not strong enough to take on the Pacific Ocean. Yet, it beckons millions to it. We go to it. We play by it. We relax by it. We sail on it. And yet, it is such a strong, powerful, terrifying body of water. So why are people trembling before God? What are they afraid of? Well, it's because God is a terrifying God. I love going to the ocean because it reminds me of how big God is. Well, I can't even get my mind around how big God is, but when I look at the ocean, that's terrifying. But God is way bigger and way more powerful than the ocean. He is more pure than the purest element on this planet, and we are sinners, and we cannot even approach him. He is terrifying holiness. God was going to descend on Mount Sinai with his perfection and all his holiness and all his glory. This was an incredible audio and visual experience for the Israelites that was playing out that they got to to witness. Here at church on a regular basis, we try to have a great audio experience for you with the band and our tech team works hard. Our, Our computer techs work hard to, to have some great visuals on the screen for you, but it doesn't compare to the audio visual experience on Mount Sinai. Look at, look at what happened here in Exodus 19. It says smoke, fire like a furnace, earthquake, and then there was this trumpet sound, and this must have been one incredible trumpet because over and above all that commotion, you could hear this trumpet sound blaring. Author uh, Tim Keller, he says, we are in such deep denial of how bad we are. We're in such deep denial of how bad we are. God is not just a warm fuzzy. He is a powerful God. He created the universe. He created the planet. He created the Pacific Ocean. He is powerful. And God all throughout scripture, he comes in power. He came to Jacob as a powerful wrestler. He came as a blizzard or hurricane in the book of Job. He is a strong man of war in Joshua. And I put these references in your notes if you want to look them up this week. Moses, he cannot be shown the face of God or he would be dead. And so God, what? He hides him in the cleft of a rock as he goes by Moses. When Isaiah saw the Lord in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah said, woe to me, I am ruined for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And Peter, when he encountered Jesus and he recognized who Jesus was in Luke 5, 8, it says that Peter fell at Jesus' knees and he said to Jesus, go away from me, Lord. Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. When you get close to God, you realize how sinful you are. And we can be in such deep denial of how bad we are. I know I can be when we're not walking that close with the Lord. When we don't understand how big and how powerful, how pure and how holy God is. But God warned the people about getting too close. Don't get too close to this mountain that I am coming down on and my presence is here. And because the form of my purity and power is, is more powerful than any nuclear bomb. Do not get close or you are going to be dead. And in spite of the fact that God is terrifying, he's also a beckoning God. He calls us unto himself. He called his people, the Israelites, unto himself. And I kind of see that as the cloud coming down. The cloud kind of shrouded his presence. It didn't diminish his power, but it protected those who are coming to him. And the cloud today is the blood of Christ. And you can come to God if you by faith, trust that Christ died on the cross for your sins on your behalf. And then you can approach the throne of God's grace with confidence through Christ. Amen? And so God now brings the Ten Commandments. And he informs Moses, he informs God's people of how he is to be loved, how he is to be treated. And so number three is guidelines for how to treat God and others. Guidelines for how to treat God and others. Let's read the Ten Commandments, this passage in Exodus chapter 20. We're going to start in verse 1, Exodus 20, verse 1. It says, And God spoke all these words. 
I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And then verse 3 through 17, he unpacks these 10 commandments that he gives to Moses, who he uh, commissions to tell the Israelites. But understand this before you understand verses 3 through 17. Before you memorize verses 3 through 17, you need to understand and memorize verse 2. Verse 2 is important. It frames the Ten Commandments. This is the God who is giving you the Ten Commandments. What kind of God is he? Let's read verse 2. Again, I am the Lord your God who did what? Who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. God has provided Christ to save you from the effects of sin in your life and my life. It's the God who loves the world so much that he provided Christ. This is the God who unpacks the Ten Commandments. Don't forget that. Let's continue reading. Verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or the waters below. And that's pertinent to them. They just came out of a land of Egypt where they worshiped multiple gods. Verse 5, and you shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Your relationship with God is not just about you. You don't live in a vacuum. People are watching you. People see how you interact with God, and it affects other people in your family in your community, and we're reading that right here. Verse six, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do, not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is within them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. God's saying, take a break. Work your tail off, but make sure you take a break. Don't forget me. And take a break with your family. Appreciate these gifts that I've given you. And don't forget me. This is a holy day for you to learn more about me and appreciate what I've blessed you with. Verse 13, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Those are all external. Those are all actions. They're very important. But then verse 17, he goes internal. He goes directly to the heart of the matter. Verse 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. This is wanting something to an unhealthy extent. What do you want that is unhealthy? What do you want so bad that it it is kind of overtaken your mind and your heart? That's what he's talking about here. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, his iPhone or his iPad, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Anything that belongs to your neighbor. Be content with God himself and what he has blessed you with. So God gave Moses these moral laws and these commandments are split up. The first four are about the vertical relationship and how we relate to God, how we honor and show love to our beloved who showed us love first. And then Commandments 5 through 10 guide us in how we treat people. It's the horizontal relationships we have. And we can go to 5 through 10 to understand how we're to relate to those around us. And even in that, it honors God. For Jesus said the greatest commandments are love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God and in the same way, love people. If you're not loving people, you're not loving God. You can't just love God and hate your neighbor. They're related. They're related. So God provided Moses with a set of tablets. And on these 10 laws and the accompanying laws that came out of them became the moral and spiritual foundation for this new nation, Israel. And it's been 
the foundation for much of civilization for thousands of years, even to today. Aren't you thankful for the Ten Commandments? Aren't you thankful that it's against the law to murder? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It happens, but praise the Lord that that's a law. It comes from the Ten Commandments, and we still adopt it today. But the, the purpose of God's law is deliverance, not domination. The purpose of God's law is deliverance, not domination. And that's the message of the Ten Commandments. God brought his people out of bondage. They would not experience true liberty, however, without the guidelines that God set forth. So then they can avoid being slaves to selfishness, slaves to sin, and hurt other people. God used miracles to set them free, but his laws were to keep them free. He used a miracle, the virgin birth, a sinless life, a death on a cross of Christ. That's miraculous. And then the empty tomb. That's God's miracle. He used that to set you free. He keeps his word to keep you free. Someone said the river carves a channel, then the channel controls the river. I love that. The river carves a channel, but then the channel controls the river. If we persist in living sinful lives, soon those sins will control us. So these commandments and all of scriptures, it's a blueprint to live a beautiful life, to live the best life possible for you, no matter what is going on around you. Like at at one university, on the first day of the new term, the dean addressed the students, and he said, He said, all right, guys, the the women's dormitory is off limits for you. Ladies, the men's dormitory is off limits to you. That's our rule here at this school. And he said, anyone caught breaking this rule the first time, $20 fine. If you get caught the second time, $60 fine. If you get caught a third time, it's $180 fine. And then one student, guy, he put up his hand and said, how much for a season pass? (laughs) We try to get out and weasel around and find loopholes for rules, don't we? Even for God's rules for us. But we need rules. Imagine playing the game of soccer without rules. It would not be fun or basketball or hockey or whatever game. It would not be fun at all. Imagine getting on the freeway Monday morning and you see the electronic signs come out and it says, no more traffic laws, have fun. That would be ridiculous. That would probably be your last day of fun. (laughs) It would be insanity. Later when Jesus was asked which commandments were the greatest, again, he said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. These sum up both the God word and the man word commandments. Freedom under restraint becomes power. Freedom under restraint becomes power. Let's look at 2 Timothy 3.16. It speaks to this beautifully. It says, every part of scripture is what? God breathed. It's God breathed. It's a miracle of God. It's a gift to us. Every part of scripture is God breathed and useful one way or another, showing us truth. Anybody want truth? I do, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion. We've all got blind spots. We've got to read scripture to learn how to live right before a holy God, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's way. Through the word, we are put together and shaped up for the tasks God has for us. Freedom under restraint becomes power. See, no horse gets anywhere, anywhere, until he is harnessed. No steam or gas drives anything until it is confined. No waterfall ever turned anything. All these pictures aren't coming up. Go to the next slide. Look at the power of a horse. It needs to be constrained and restrained. Next slide. Steam power needs to be contained and constrained in order to push a locomotive forward. Next slide. A waterfall. Do you know how these lights turn on? Do you understand how electricity works? It comes from mostly from water. Water falling. But it has to be constrained and sent into turbines and controlled. 
music. Next slide. It takes a ton of time to follow the rules of practice, 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 and the rules of music and understanding it to get to the point where you can be an incredible musician and bless those around you with that talent that God has given you. It takes a long time to stick with those rules of practice, though. Freedom under restraint becomes power. There is blessing in godly boundaries. There is blessing in godly boundaries in your life. God gave these Ten Commandments for His people that day through Moses, and we'll see as the story continues whether they followed them or not. And they had seasons of following them. They had seasons of not following them. But they are the basis for the Judeo-Christian ethic through the millennia, even through to today. And we're called to follow them, but you're not going to follow them perfectly. You're not going to follow them perfectly. But that's why Christ came, to give you the opportunity to come with God, even though you're going to fall short. And if you're not a believer, I want to encourage you to come to Christ. Just admit that you are a sinner. Admit that you fall short. Believe that Christ died on the cross for your sins and then choose to follow Christ. What I'm talking about this morning is choose to want to honor and love your beloved. Find out what honors and pleases your beloved. And he's telling us this morning, my Ten Commandments, my scripture, my word that I have blessed you with. Now imagine if the Ten Commandments were a priority in our nation, if it was a priority over every state, what would happen? What difference would would that make? Crime rate would probably plummet. Violence and abortion would maybe cease. Government corruption maybe would be so much less. Prisons might soon be empty. Teen pregnancy, divorce, hate, racism, terrorism, could possibly be obliterated. You could walk down the street without fear. You could fall asleep at night without your door locked. If you knew that everybody was trying to please their beloved, their creator, by following what he says. But the only way a nation can change is if individuals change, is if you and I decide that we want to make God a priority in our lives and that pleasing Him is the most important thing in our lives. So we want to follow His commands out of our loving response to Him. Not so we can get something, but because of what He gave us. And then love people around us and be the light of the world. See, God loves you no matter what. Love God by following His commands no matter what. God loves you no matter what. Love God by following his commands, no matter what is going on around you, no matter where your emotions and your feelings are taking you, no matter what situation you're in. And if you do that, he will make you a light in the world. He will make you into an incredible matchmaker to lead people in a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that... You sent a matchmaker in my life, my friend, who introduced me to Christ. And God, absolutely, I I was annoyed with him. I couldn't stand him. (laughs) I couldn't stand that he always talked about his love for you, God, and and how he wanted to honor you and how he wanted to obey you and how he wanted to to get involved in uh, the body of Christ, which is uh, called the church, which is your people simply gathering together to learn more about your commands, learn more about your scripture, and grow more in you and, and, and show their love to you. But Father, thank you for my friend. And Father, I pray that I would not forsake understanding the gift that you've given me freely by your grace, the obedience that you call me to, and the blessing that you're going to pour out on me and through me to my family, to my friends, to my community. There's more at stake than just my relationship with you, Lord. And I, God, I pray that you'd empower our church. Use us, God, in a mighty way in our community. Help us to never give up shining your light and being a matchmaker and leading people to Jesus. God, I pray for that person who we're thinking of that maybe we'll be having lunch with, talking on the phone with this week, texting, communicating on Facebook with, whatever the case, God. I pray that we would be a light Maybe a little bit of an annoying light, but maybe may we couch that with love, but still go in boldness and, and talk about our beloved. 
God, thanks for being the great I am. In Jesus' name, amen.